Hi everyone, welcome to Disabled in the Wild. I'm Amy and today I'm going to be sharing my list of must-haves for outdoor adventures. Now everyone's list of must-haves is going to be different. It's going to depend on what activities you're doing, your location, your unique combination of abilities, disabilities, and illnesses. Um, so while this list is specific to me and my needs, I thought it might be helpful to share some of the features that I look for in outdoor gear and maybe give you some ideas for your own list of must-haves. So this first one I want to talk about is probably the most useful for people with chronic illness and disabilities. Uh, most of the time I don't mind sitting on the ground when I'm outside, and in fact I probably prefer it, but sometimes the ground is wet or uncomfortable or I have to be more careful about ticks and spiders. Um, my doctor says I'm not allowed to get any more bug bites, so on the occasion that I need to sit up off the ground, I have this lightweight, compact, portable chair. It fits in my backpack or I can clip it to the outside. It only takes two minutes to set up and put away. They do make more expensive ones, but this one was only $25 and it works great. Um, it's more comfortable than it looks, and it's nice to have the option to sit down and rest my legs but also lean back on something and rest my upper body as well. So this chair is perfect for when I'm going to be spending a lot of time in one place, but if I'm just walking through and I need a quick place to sit and take a break before moving on, then I have this portable stool. It only takes two seconds to set up. Um, it fits easily into small bags. And I think this one was only like 10 bucks. Uh, by the way, I'll be putting links to everything in the description below. So those of us who are chronically ill know that anytime we leave the house, we have to bring a lot of shit. <laughs> I will never be one of those people that just goes for a quick stroll through nature without some kind of bag to carry all my stuff. So for shorter trips, like if I'm just walking in a park, I use this small shoulder outdoor bag. It's just enough room for a water bottle, uh, my portable stool, medications, and sunscreen. I chose this bag in particular because of its shape. It helps it stay on my hip as I'm walking instead of swinging into my crutches uh, or as I'm bending down to pick up rocks because this is also my rock collecting bag. For longer trips, I use this backpack. <laughs> For me, finding the right backpack took some searching. As a forearm crutch user, I need to be able to move my arms freely and not bash my elbows into a wide bulky backpack. So it was important for me to find something that was narrow, but still had plenty of room for all my gear, plus a 25 pound bag of rocks. <laughs> now I have tried all of the expensive backpacks in the past, and despite them being the top recommended gear, with all their fancy features and high tech, whatever, whatever, I couldn't fit anything into them. And they actually found them to be pretty uncomfortable. So on a whim, I decided to order this cheap, nameless backpack uh, from Amazon because it was long and narrow and looked like it had a lot of space. And so far I've had it for five years. It is the best backpack I've ever owned. And I literally paid $20 for it. So it's a perfect example that you do not need to spend a fortune on outdoor gear. So this one probably seems obvious. <laughs> As a forearm crutch user, of course forearm crutches are going to be on my list of must-haves, but I wanted to point out a few things to look for when choosing forearm crutches for the outdoors. First, ergonomic handles will provide a more comfortable grip and help reduce wrist pain. Shocks will make it more comfortable to walk over various terrain. Some crutches have adjustable height and some have interchangeable feet. A closed cuff style will mean you can move your arms more freely without the crutches falling down. I also find that it's helpful to be able to easily swap the cuff size. I wear a small cuff 90% of the time, but in the winter when I'm wearing lots of layers and my Carhartt jacket, I use a larger cuff. I recently upgraded to side sticks, which are the forearm crutches for hiking. And while they're wonderful, you do not need to spend hundreds of dollars to get decent forearm crutches for hiking. I used Millennial Medical's InMotion Pro forearm crutches for five years and they worked very well for me. 
Um, whether you spend $100 or $700 on crutches, just think about how you're going to be using them and look into what features and accessories might be available for the crutches that you do choose. If you've seen any of my videos on YouTube or Instagram, you've probably noticed that I'm usually wearing gloves. Using forearm crutches means shifting your body weight from your legs into your hands as you walk, so it's really important to protect your hands. I always like to say you wouldn't go for a hike without socks, so why would you use crutches without gloves? <laughs> I did not know this when I first started using forearm crutches. So after the first time I ripped my thumbs open, I started looking around the house for something to protect my hands, just as a temporary solution until I could figure out what other forearm crutch users used. And I ended up finding these old yoga gloves and they worked so well, I kept using them for five years. Um, they covered the right parts of my hands. They weren't too hot in the summer. And I especially liked the grippy bumps on them because they helped me keep a grip on the crutches even when my hands got wet or sweaty. They finally started to rip this year so I upgraded and now instead of using $5 yoga gloves I am now using $15 weight training gloves and they're amazing. They have the same coverage and grip but these ones are also padded in the palm and are very breathable so they're even more comfortable. There's a variety of weight training gloves out there, but I recommend these ones in particular because they're really great quality. They have this little strap to keep them on. And there's these two little handles that make them super easy to take off. Honestly, that feature is way more useful than I thought it would be. And now I can't live without them. So <laughs> I definitely recommend checking these out. So let's talk about shoes. <laughs> you do not need expensive hiking boots in order to start hiking. Um, all you really need to get started are shoes that are comfortable to walk in, whatever that means for you. And then as you start hiking more, if you do decide to invest in good hiking boots, you'll have a better idea of what features are going to be most useful for you in terms of terrain, the activities that you're doing, as well as your body's needs. For example, if you're on really rocky terrain, then a sturdier boot with a lot of ankle support and grip is probably going to be the way to go. Whereas if you're looking for something lightweight and built for speed, then trail runners would be the better option. Um, the most important features are going to vary from person to person. So what's going to be the best shoe is going to differ as well. For me, I actually used trail runners for three years, not because I wanted to run in them, but because at the time I was really struggling with lifting my feet. Um, so I needed something that was very lightweight and not at all bulky so that I wouldn't trip over them. Um, but now it's easier for me to lift my feet. So it's more important for me to have that ankle support and grip, considering that I do spend a lot of time on rocks in various terrain. So I bought a pair of La Sportiva boots this year. Um, when I first saw them, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to walk in those. But they're surprisingly feather light. The bottoms are super grippy. They are made with Gore-Tex, so they're waterproof while still being breathable. They have ankle support while not being too restrictive, and they come in wide sizes, so they actually fit my feet properly. They were pretty expensive. I got them on sale for like 150 bucks, but for me it was worth the investment because they really are the perfect boots for me. Just like with backpacks though, the more expensive shoe doesn't automatically make it the better option. For example, I've used Keen sandals for years, and while they are very sturdy and well-made and have lasted me like a decade, they're just not a good fit for where I'm recreating. I get a bunch of little rocks under my feet that I can't get out unless I take the sandals off, um, and that seems to happen every five minutes. So finally this summer I got fed up, and I decided to try these $25 water shoes from Amazon, and honestly they're a way better fit. Um, no more rocks under my feet, they have just enough grip to get me across the river safely, and I wish I had switched sooner. <laughs> Lastly, I just want to remind folks that hiking boot sizes are a little bit different from street shoe sizes. Um, so be prepared to go up a half to a full size up from what you normally wear. 
And don't be afraid to spend lots of time finding what works for you. How you support your feet is going to affect how the rest of your body is supported. And in turn, that's going to affect your experiences both during and after your adventure. So it's worth it taking the time to find the right shoes. <laughs> This must have is for all the lovely people out there who have to squat when they pee outside instead of having the luxury of standing up. <laughs> Everyone has their own method for peeing outside. Some people use the shiwi, some people bring toilet paper to use and then pack it out. Some people just try to drip dry. For me, I had a hard time using the shiwi and I don't like dealing with packing out used toilet paper. And to me, drip drying just means you're probably going to end up sitting in wet underwear all day, which, as we know, is not good for us. My method involves wearing a lighter days pad or a panty liner. I usually put it on before I even leave the house so I don't have to worry about it when I get there, um, so that when I pop a squat to pee in the bushes and do my thing, shake my lower body a couple of times to drip dry, hopefully without falling over, and then pull up my pants, the liner or pad will absorb any excess moisture and keep my parts dry. <laughs> so highly recommend trying this method. As a rock hound, I am constantly touching rocks and the ground so my hands get covered in dirt, mud, river water, algae, cow shit, <laughs> god knows what else. I also take about 50 pills a day, that doesn't stop just because I'm outside, and I have to eat with certain medications and at specific times of day, so I have to be able to clean my hands when I'm outside. Um, usually what I do is I wipe my hands off first, then I follow up with hand sanitizer. Um, these are the wipes that I use. They come in large sheets, they're very sturdy, and they're also biodegradable. And then for hand sanitizer, I just keep a small bottle of Purell in my bag. As I mentioned, I get very muddy and dirty and it gets everywhere. <laughs> Nothing in my backpack is safe from the dirt and mud. So I like to keep my important stuff like medicine and electronics in a separate bag. And for that, I use a waterproof dry bag. So these bags are actually made for recreating in and near water. And that's originally why I started to use them to protect my stuff uh, as I was crossing the Blackfoot River, just in case I fell in. Um, but then I noticed that they were good at protecting my stuff from dirt too, so now I use them all the time. It clips to the outside of my backpack so I can access everything really easily. They cost anywhere from like $8 to $30 or more, and they come in a variety of sizes and colors. <laughs> As we all know, drinking water is very important, especially when we're doing outdoor activities, and for that we need a reusable water bottle. There's a huge variety of water bottles to choose from. Some people like the metal ones, some people like the Nalgies with the wide mouth, some people like hydration packs. I personally don't like any of those, plus I can't do anything with the straw because they grow mold really easily. So this is the water bottle that I do use, and I'm a huge fan of these. It's by Camelback. It's 32 ounces. There is no straw. The water spout is the perfect size. The lid comes off for easier cleaning. And my favorite part is that the cap is attached to the bottle and has a magnet in it to keep it out of the way as you drink. Finally, it is always a good idea to protect ourselves from the elements and prepare for the unexpected. Safety gear can mean any number of things like a first aid kit, a snake bite kit, a tick bite kit, tick tweezers, bug spray, bear spray, a battery bank, sun protection like sunscreen, a hat, sunglasses and long sleeves, maybe dirt and smoke protection like a buff bandana or mask. Depending on where you are and what you're doing, it might also be a good idea to carry basic survival gear, like a fire starter, a knife, cordage, high calorie food. You hopefully won't ever need it, but shit happens and it's best to be prepared just in case. That's my list of must-haves for outdoor adventures. I hope I've given you some good ideas, just in time for holiday sales and the gift-giving season. 
Um, please feel free to share in the comments your own must-haves or favorite brands and features in outdoor gear to give even more ideas to those in our community. Take good care of you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Summer, I finally got fed up and I decided to try these $25. Good. Rocks in various terrains. Terrain. Terrain. <laughs> Even when my hands got wet or sweaty. Or sweaty. <laughs> Considering that I do spend a lot of time. Sorry. <laughs> For longer trips, I use. Oh no. <laughs> I fed up this summer and decided to buy. Oh gosh. <laughs> have the option to not only sit down and rest my legs <sighs> my method involved I did not know this one are you fucking kidding me god damn it Riley Riley go home hey you gotta go home, bud. <laughs>